Good morning. Good morning. I'm Bob Cooper. And I'm Doris Barnes. And we're with Elite Worldwide. And thanks so much for joining us. And uh, I hope that you're ready to take a look at what you're going to be able to do with 2015. I really do hope that 2014 was really and still is a really great year for all you guys and gals. But let's uh, let's do what we need to do to make 2015 even a better year. What do you think, Doris? Sound like a plan? I think that sounds like a wonderful idea. Thanks for joining us, you guys. Thanks for taking time out of your day to be here. Yeah, we know that you're busy and your time is valuable. So, Doris, if you're ready, I'm ready. We'll get started. Now on board with that? Sounds perfect. Okay, great, Doris. For those of you that are new to us, let's make sure that we understand what our objective is here today. We're looking to help you build a more profitable, successful business, which is the bottom line. Not just talking about the income that you're going to earn, but the value of your business and how you're going to be able to help a lot more people in your community. That's our objective. And a little bit about Elite for those of you who may be newer to us. We are an ethics-based company, and we always put this up as the number one descriptor of our organization for good reason. This is really what we live by, and so we're always going to make every decision based off of if it's the right thing to do for the right reason. Amen. We certainly do. We're a different kind of company. You're going to find those of you that are new to us. We're always creating. We're always looking at new and unique ways of helping you in building your businesses. That's one of our one of our core drivers here at Elite. And our family includes all types of auto repair facilities worldwide. Uh, so we, you know, we really do have our fingers out there in a lot of different places in this industry. Uh, but our love, our heart and soul is you guys, and it's the independent market, uh, which is about 90% of what we do. Yeah, you bet. And we help the guys and gals in the industry in many different ways. We have coaching programs. We have all different kind of seminars that we provide. We have peer groups like Pro Service. It's known or literally across the country, a lot of different ways that we help you guys and gals. And lastly, we all live by a principle that we'll never put money ahead of people. And we know that if we do this, if we do the right things, like I said earlier, for the right reasons, then, you know, what money is going to follow. But the objective is to better people's lives along the way. Amen. So true, Doris. So true. So, look, let's talk about how they can benefit, Doris. So, how does that benefit today and in an everyday in life, I guess? Please keep an open mind. Uh, this seems to be one of the key factors in some of the most successful people that I've come across. And I know Bob will, will certainly echo the same. They're always asking, don't, you know, don't tell me what I'm doing well. Tell me what I can do a little differently. Because predictably, if you're going to do the same things over and over, you're going to get the same results. So looking for new ways to get from here to there. So we're certainly going to hope that we can stimulate some of those things for you today. Yeah, you bet. That's going to be one of our objectives here today. And please make sure that you do everything that you can. We know that you're busy. We know that your time is valuable. We know that you have a lot going on. But anything you do to be in a position where you're not going to be interrupted is going to be in your best interest. And uh, raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. You guys, we're actually going to make sure uh, that at the end of the webinar, we take time to do that for you. So um, at that time during this presentation, you will have an opportunity to do so. So all you'll need to do is click on the little icon. There's a little hand that will raise. Um, and this way, we'll be able to unmute you and have you share your question with us. Yeah, there you go. And like Doris said, don't forget, at the end of the presentation, we have a little bit of time that we've logged out just for you guys and gals to answer any questions about any of the content that we're covering here with you today. And then, of course, you got to make sure that you make a commitment to yourself to follow through. So, Doris, I'm on board with getting started if you are. Well, hopefully, you guys and gals are ready. And let's take a look at some of the things that you can do to really make sure that when it comes to the world of sales, the 2015 is you're going to be your best year ever. So, Doris, we're off to the race. If you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. All right. So, tip number one that we want to share with you guys today is make sure that you have the right people. Oh, my goodness. Fundamental to growing any great company is you can't have average folks. You really have to have extraordinary people on board. And the first thing here that it says is you guys have to have advisors that can sell. Um, I think a common misconception that our industry has is just because you have a technical background or you were a technician in the past and you might be able to at least get in front of the customer and, and, and feel somewhat comfortable that you're going to be a great service advisor because of that technical expertise. And unfortunately, that average customer experience, if that person really doesn't have the superstar stuff, if they're not driven, if they don't have a natural people talent, if they're not goal-focused, if they don't want to continually get better at what they're doing, um, if they don't help your customers to see the value in your repairs, if they're not tenacious, if they can't portray belief in what they're selling. And so not just getting the customer to say yes, but walking away feeling really good about that decision and going, you know what, I'm in the right place with the right people. So that's extraordinary. And this is something your advisors, they're the face of your company. And we average just will not cut it there, guys. 
Yeah, well said, Doris, and I agree with her a thousand percent, and I hope that you do too. And they actually, I'm putting together this webinar for you guys and gals. Doris and I put our heads together, and we put a lot of thought into this. And we thought, what are the hallmarks? What are the things you're going to need to do? And it's always first things first. You've got to make sure that you have the right guys and gals at those service counters. Like she says, these are people that have to be charmers. These are people that really are passionate about what they're doing. When the phone rings, they gravitate toward it, not away from it. When a customer comes in, they make eye contact. They naturally smile. They don't have to be told to smile. They actually gravitate toward that client. These are the guys and gals that you need to have on the front counter. If you don't have that guy or gal on the counter, then you probably have the wrong guy or gal working in your business at this point. Number two, you've got to have technicians, as you all know, that can produce. One of the many things that you sell, the core of what you sell, is your labor hours. So you've got to have the guys and gals out there that can get the work done. These guys got, and gals got to be very, very, very productive people. And then lastly, you've got to have the right customers. And this is one of the things that we've learned over the years and work with all of our coaching clients and all of our clients in pro service. What we do is we help them understand that you've got to figure out who the ideal guy or gal is to have in your service as your service customers. Most shop owners don't do that. They were, yeah. Most shop owners don't do that. What they'll do is they'll just put out ads and they'll run, they'll run different kind of ad campaigns in their community and they'll bring in a lot of the wrong kinds of people. So you've got to figure out who this guy and gal is. And there's an easy way to do it. Now is not the time to discuss it in detail, but actually the answers that you're looking for are in your database. And there's ways that you can go into your customer database and you could draw the conclusion as to who this right guy or gal is based on frequency, based on sales, based on visits, based on the kind of personalities that they have, believe it or not, based on the kind of vehicles they drive, based on their, their social networking. There's a lot of things you need to consider. But once you figure out who that guy or gal is, you put them, in your, you put them into your service counter as a customer, you have technicians in the back that can produce it, and you've got advisors that can sell. The rest is history. Your sales will go up. There's no question about that. Yeah. So, absolutely, yeah. We've got to we've, we've got to get good at, at really deciphering psychographically and demographically speaking who we're after. Because once we do that, then we know what marketing efforts are going to be most effective at reaching them. Where we're going to find them? Where are they located? What do they do? How do they spend their time? How are we going to be able to connect with them? What what messages in our marketing are going to attract this type of customer? So this really is key to your success, and not, don't take a blanket marketing approach. So. You know, that's something that we spend a lot of time on here at Elite. Sure is, sure is. So tip number one, make sure that you have the right guys and gals in your world. Make sure that you have advisors that can sell. Make sure that you have technicians that can produce. And certainly make sure that you have the right customers in your service facilities. Mm -hmm. Tip number two, which is a really cool one, too. And, again, we put a lot of work into this. And guys and gals, you've got to make sure that you have the right systems in your company. Systems is the operative word here. One of the things you need to do, and this was brought to us by one of these rock star coaches that we have that work with us, Kevin Vaughn, who, who just does an amazing job with his client. One of the clients, one of the things that uh, Kevin does is he always speaks of what he refers to as, as the 100% rule that he shares with his clients. And it literally means 100% of the vehicles that come in that facility have to be inspected 100%. That means one end of the vehicle to the other. And it has to be done 100% of the time. And 100% of those customers need to be told 100% of what was discovered on their car. So this might sound like a long list of things that you need to do, but you know what? You can't drop the ball with each and every, with any one of those points. I'm sure you'll agree. Every customer that comes into your facility, every single one, we have an ethical responsibility to properly, ethically, professionally inspect that automobile. I'm not talking about beating people over the head and trying to sell them something that they don't need. We're talking about ethics. Inspect that automobile and let them know what you discovered. It's their automobiles, it's their money, it's their safety, it's their family, but we have that responsibility to give them the information that they're entitled to use. It's called the 100% rule. Adoris? Love this rule, you guys, and I'm sure that you're hearing it and loving it, too. Um, but you guys, like Bob said, it, this is not only your entire opportunity, it's your entire business in making sure that you're thorough and, and maximizing every opportunity that comes to the door. But what Bob said, I think, is so important, and I hope that resonates with all of you. It really is the right thing to do. And if we take the approach of being worried about scaring away this customer, if they're a first-time customer, they come in for an oil change, and we go, oh, my goodness, or your advisor freezes and they freak out, they don't know how to handle that. They haven't been through that exercise or had the right training. How do I approach this customer? Well, it's without reasoning. Let the customer know 
that it's for their benefit. How do they win by us doing complete and total thorough inspections, even if they might not want to hear everything that we've got to share with them? We've got to get good at articulating that. And if we do, we're going to have the right customers coming in and understanding that it's about them, not us. Yeah, amen, amen. I agree to that one. Well, you guys, uh, we actually have a, a special guest that I'm going to bring in. <laughs> We're really excited to have her with us. She's actually in another meeting right now, but she uh, offered that she said she could squeeze away for a minute and come join us. And Jen Monclus is who we want to bring in to uh, kind of share uh, some advice on the next few tips. She heads up our advanced sales training course called the Master's Program for Service Advisors. And these next few tips, I think you're going to appreciate them, but Jen's going to be able to really give us some insight here. So. Uh, yeah. I'm going to grab Yeah, her. grab her. Okay. Grab her. Grab her, if you would, please. Jen is very gifted, very, very gifted at what she does. And again, she teaches a lot of the students in what we call the master's course. And I asked her earlier, I said, Jen, I know that you're going to be busy today. Your schedule is packed, but is there any chance that you might be able to spend just a few minutes with us? And she said that she would be more than happy to do so. So what we're going to do is I'm going to bring up some bullet points here, and I'm going to get my good friend Jen to discuss these. So if you take a look, the very next bullet point says, record all of your incoming phone calls. So Doris, Jen, welcome back. Thanks for joining us. I just brought up a bullet point here that says, record all your incoming phone calls. Hey, Jen. Hi. Great seeing you. Hello. Look like a family over here, right? Oh, yeah, we're all sort of crammed in, crammed in here. Jen and I were just telling these guys and gals a little bit about you. I hope your ears weren't burning too much. And uh, one of the things that we're saying to them is it's critically important that they record their incoming calls, see how their guys and gals are doing. Absolutely. Yeah, we do uh, a ton of training here at Elite, and we work with advisors uh, with sales capacities, and it's vital. We have them always recording incoming calls. Um, such a great self-discovery tool. Uh, they learn a lot about themselves. Um, they actually can progress to the next level by listening to these. So. Fabulous things about recording incoming calls is you guys can go back, you can listen to these and look into the tonality. You know, is your advisor sounding helpful? Are they having a great day? Are they eager to help this first time customer? Um, fact finding, you know, is your advisor asking the right questions? Yeah. Are they uh, properly asking enough? Are they controlling the conversation? Are they helping this first time customer out? Um, you know, most importantly, too, are they following uh, phone procedures that the shop owner has in place? You guys should have systems for certain scenarios that come in, and they should be following these steps. So um, students love it. They learn yeah. a lot about them. Is, is that great or what? So guys, the gals, don't forget, record your incoming calls. And you know one of the other things that we found is elite, and I think that this is really cool, you're going to find that your lead count is automatically going to go up if you do nothing else but start recording the calls. Because when these guys and gals that work with you in capacities of picking up the phone, when they know that they're being monitored, when they know that, they're automatically going to improve their behavior. So watch how you get more leads when you start recording your calls. How about this one, Jen? Record your sales presentation. Ooh, another big one. We do a lot of that. We do a lot of that. Uh, that's mandatory. Uh, the guys love this, too. Um, we're really looking for whether or not they're following a formatted sales cycle. Are they following the right steps? Um, are they getting the yes? And they learn a lot about themselves. Mm -hmm. They could be repeating the same comments over and over again or same statements, and it's, it's a big learning tool. Um, we want to make sure they're selling themselves and they're selling the text and they're selling the customer back on their vehicle. And are they selling the repair? So these are great. Um, you can go back and listen. Uh, make sure that they're putting your customer at ease every step of the way throughout the sales presentation. So it's just a vital tool. So you're encouraging all of these guys and gals to record their incoming calls and have their advisors within a world of legality and meeting with all your state laws and all record their sales presentations Absolutely. to their customers. Absolutely. So go back and listen to it and find out what you did really well and where you could improve in your yeah. sales presentation. Hey. Hey, hey, Doris, do yeah. you have something to say? I, well, I was just, yeah, absolutely. I think when there's an expectation that this is going to be done on a regular basis, it also allows your staff to become keen to this. They start to expect it. They start to go, you know what? Um, I better be paying attention. I better be continually working to improve my skills. I better be introspective. I better be able to go back and go, you know what? What can I learn from this sale? And, if, and, and by gosh, if you're going to be doing this with them from time to time, which you should be as a leader, then they're going to know that they should be prepared to share with you where did they do well, where could they use improvement, what are the things that they're going to be working on to get better. So this is absolutely critical. Great message, huh, guys and gals? I hope that you agree. How about this one, Jen? Create and utilize the benefit checklist. Can you give us uh, 
heads up, can you give our audience a heads up as to what this is all about? Sure. Benefit checklist is all about value. Mm -hmm. What is your advisor going to display as far as value goes for getting, for saying yes? Mm -hmm. well, how's the customer going to win? Mm -hmm. So we have um, our advisors creating really long, extensive benefits lists, and it's for any job, anything that they can sell your customer. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a cheat sheet that mm -hmm. they can refer mm -hmm. to whenever they sell. They mm -hmm. refer to this particular job, and there's a bulleted line item benefits mm -hmm. as to how the customer wins mm -hmm. and how the vehicle wins mm -hmm. if they say yes. Mm -hmm. So we've got our guys building these, and they're critical to sales success. And every time an advisor is going to sell a job, it's his responsibility for one of your students to pick up that benefit checklist and review it mm -hmm. before he even picks up the phone to call the customer, safe to say? Every time. Can you give us an example of one of them, Jen? Uh, yeah, really simple. We could do an air filter. Okay. You know, most advisors are going to go down the technical road of moisture content and recommending air filters mm -hmm. because of time is due. But we don't want these advisors to be in that, that spot. Mm -hmm. We want them to talk about benefits. Mm -hmm. So how does the customer win? Things like uh, better gas mileage. Mm -hmm. You know, what that means to the customer is more money. Mm -hmm. um, better fuel economy, you know, means that they're going to be at the gas mm -hmm. pump less. Mm -hmm. um, saves them time, saves them a lot of pain, right? Mm -hmm. um, as well as reduced emissions. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are big on protecting the environment. Mm -hmm. That's another Good one point. they can add. Yeah. Good so point. building on that list. Good point. How about like vehicle maintenance, going ahead and doing a scheduled service, like a 30,000 mile service? Absolutely. We want everything that they sell to be listed on this benefit list, huh. and they're going to explain to the customer how they win. Mm -hmm. It's all about value. It's not about parts and labor. Okay. Cool. Good stuff. So start building these lists. Uh, literally just open up a Word document and have your team involved. Use your tech, mm -hmm. uh, Google, everything. Because off the top of your head, even as business owners, as people who maybe understand this industry really well, you may think of a couple benefits, but as you start to do your due diligence, you're going to find five or six or seven key core important benefits, drawing it out to the ultimate benefit to the customer, saving them time and money, um, squeezing uh, every dollar out of that car when it finally needs to get a new home better resale value. Uh, like Jen mentioned, a couple of key ones, uh, increasing fuel economy, protecting the environment, uh, protecting the warranty. Uh, we're talking more about maintenance benefits now. But um, these are the things that you just want to have as a cheat sheet on every single possible job, not just maintenance, but mechanical repair, everything. 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 So work in progress takes time to develop, but every time you go to add a new, uh, every time you go to sell a new job that's not yet on the list, do the homework on it, add it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful tool. Yeah, and a really neat thing about doing this, what Jen is asking each and every one of you to do, is don't forget, if a customer comes in, and I'm just giving you an example, if they authorize the 30 mile, 30,000 mile service, when they leave after they pay for that service, if they don't really have their head around all of the benefits, they're going to feel as though they just spent that money for something that had to be done, sort of like a torture that they went through. Well, I had to spend money to get my car serviced but they're not going to feel good about the decision. We want your customers to feel good about the decision. They want them, we want them sitting in their car smiling when they're driving away going, you know, I'm really glad that I authorized that service. Now I understand why I need to have an air filter replaced. Now I understand why I need to bring my car in from scheduled maintenance. Now I understand how I'm going to benefit by having this cooling system service done. Put together those checklists. And how can they get the information for them, for the checklists that they're going to build? Oh, together as a team, meaning you can get with the tech. Google online research. Um, our students at least use each other, but uh, team environment, get the shop owners involved. Yeah. So that's a whole month for our, our viewers. Absolutely. Is that safe to say? Absolutely. If you guys and gals do nothing else but what Jenna's asking you to do here, you're going to hit a home month. So, Jen, before I let you scoop, incoming calls, they need to record those? Absolutely. Okay. No record your sales presentations, too? All of them. All of them. Did you see? She rolled her eyes. You didn't see that. I saw that. She will drive all of them. That means all of them, guys, because listen to the gal that knows. She knows, and they need to get these benefit checklists in place. Yeah, cool. Is this lady gifted or what? Huh? Jen, thanks for joining us. Hi, guys. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah thanks, for thanks, for, she, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah, you're a blessing. Thanks so much, Jen. Surprise you this morning. And Doris, how about this one? And you guys, of course, mandate training for everyone. Um, it seems like there's a, a heavy focus on technical training, which there absolutely should be and has to be, to stay at the leading edge of what we do in fixing people's cars. We want to make sure that we're mandating training for everyone. So uh, your service advisors, for example, really should be uh, having a certain mandate in place. How much training do they have to do a year? Um, at least a course a year to stay sharp. Um, so we, you know, there are a lot of options here. And we're going to encourage you guys, find an approach. Part of the training experience for the front end of your business 
the service advisor and the rest of your staff there, is it needs to be centered around creating consistency and harmony in the customer experience. So now when I come in to see you, and the first time I get this wonderful experience from your advisor, Joe, and I come in and I see Jerry next time, I'm going to have the same feel. I'm going to be treated the same wonderful way. That comes down to building behavioral systems, which can only be achieved through training. So find an approach that's in harmony with your principles as a company, your ethics, how you want this customer to feel, and build on that. And be consistent. Be consistent. Great message, huh, guys and gals? So what it says up on the screen is mandated for everyone in your organization. Everyone in your organization needs to go through training, and it needs to be something that is in the calendar. That means by the end of the year, that technician needs to have that many hours in diagnostic skills or whatever it is, repair skills. That service advisor, like Doris says so well, needs to have that many hours booked, flagged, that he's com or she has completed in sales training that's been approved by you. And this is something that's just mandated. It's something that's not an iffy thing. This is something that they absolutely have to do in order to stay on your team. Yeah, guys, and real quick, we'll move on. But we do have, uh, just for getting the word out there in the industry, as some of you may not be aware, we have a course called the Master's Course. It's an advanced sales training program. Again, it's one that Jen is involved in with me. And uh, we've got the next one right around the corner with only a couple of seats remaining. So if anybody's interested, it's an advanced course. Six months starts December December 5 is when the next course starts. If you'd like to learn more, either go to our website or feel free to give us a call. You'll be thrilled that you did. Tip number three, we're changing gears here on you guys and gals. It says pay close attention to the numbers. Hi, hey, Doris. Make sure that you charge uh, for your services, right? That's mm -hmm. pretty self-explanatory, but we want, to, want you to make sure that you're really uh, being conscious of just not, don't discount your work. Get out of that habit if you're in it. Uh, it first of all, it doesn't speak well to the integrity and in what you're charging to the customer. Yeah, amen. And I'm sure that you'll all agree with Doris. And this is where a lot of guys and gals get in trouble. They wind up giving away their labor. And we're not saying that there should be kindness in you. We're not saying that there's not situations where you need to do that. But darn it, you got to get in the habit of charging for your services. One of the things that we do with our clients is we remind them that one of the things that you should do with every customer, and I know every state law is different in what you're required to do when it comes to writing up repair orders, but in a general sense, you should have a policy that says something like this. An advisor could go out to a customer's car, and they could spend up to five minutes on that automobile. They could use one hand tool at the most, no more than one hand tool, no access to any kind of technical information, no access to any of the technicians either. So if they're able to solve that problem within five minutes with a screwdriver or a pair of pliers or whatever, then it's no charge in the way the customer goes. If it breaks beyond that, if they have to get a technician involved, if they have to use more equipment or tools to get, gather information, then the clock starts. So make sure that you charge for all of the services that you provide. It's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, next it says offer optional services that will drive sales and profitability. Uh, we could actually probably spend 20 minutes talking to you about the psychology and the proven effect of providing choice to your customers at the point of sale and in every part of the customer experience. But, but, but you don't have to take our word for it. You don't have to listen to Doris and Bob here. Do your own homework. Harvard Business Review recently reported a study, on a consumer study, on the power and options and how it drives closing ratio. Uh, so just take our word for this. Uh, Start looking at better ways to provide choice to your customers. For example, uh, the, the brake pad option, you know, a premium performance kind of a pad if it warrants that. It doesn't have to be between Part A and Part B. It could be uh, saving the customer time and getting their brake fluid change done now versus in three months when it's actually due by time, right? So we're giving them the power to choose. They're in control, and there's a lot of other psychology to back it. So do your homework and take our word for this. Yeah, you've already invested the time and the money and the resources to get the vehicle in your service bay. You did the marketing. You did all the things you needed to do. You got the customer written up. Now the fact of the matter is when you're on the phone with them, consider other optional services that you could provide them, obviously within the world of ethics. Watch what that's going to do, not only to your sales, but watch what that's going to do to the profitability of your company. Because you're going to discover those optional services are going to be the most profitable points in your entire business. So don't hesitate on that. It also says track your TARO and your closing ratios. And I know that we have a limited amount of time here, but I'll, so I'll be brief with this. TARO represents technical average repair order. You're all familiar with the ARO, average repair order. The T means technical. This means every vehicle that comes into your facility needs to be properly, thoroughly, 
inspected. Everything needs to be documented, and then you price out all of those all of those discoveries. And what you're going to discover is, and we're just giving you an example, you might discover that the average vehicle that comes into your facility needs $800 worth of work. You might also discover that your technician or your advisor has an ARO of two or $300 out of the $800. That would mean that he's missing or she's missing a lot of opportunity. On the other hand, if you have a, if you have a TARO of $800 and if you have a technician that's has an ARO of 400 or $450 or $500, then he's more than likely doing a pretty good job for you. He's probably doing, he or she's probably pretty efficient. The secret here is, is by doing this, you're going to figure out how you can not only increase sales with what you already have, but you're also going to save a fortune on your marketing expenses as well, because you're not going to be spending more money to bring in more cars when you already have the opportunities in front of you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is also a really good measurement of uh, watching your service advisors get better and better at helping your customers see the value in repairs. In other words, say yes. Um, so wherever your advisor lands, when it comes to then taking that TARO or total opportunities, measuring it against sales and ARO, now we go, oh my gosh, now we can calculate a closing ratio. I hope you guys are with us on this. So wherever that closing ratio lands, we're going to continually work to improve that. Right? So this is what we want you to start to measure and monitor, and surprisingly, um, a lot of shops don't calculate these things. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. So it's one of the best kept secrets. Start monitoring and measuring what you discover on automobiles, not just what is sold on automobiles. Hey, tip number four, it says incentive the behaviors that you're looking for, and it says sales is not number one in priorities because they're all important. But guys and gals, you have to incentivize your advisors to sell. There's been an argument around since the beginning of time, hey, I got really good guys and gals, and they're all ethical and all those things. And you know what? I don't have to add, give them added incentives. I pay them on an hourly wage or I pay them on a salary. And you know what? We, we disagree with that philosophy. And you know why? This has nothing to do with money. This has everything to do with equity. It has everything to do with fairness. For the guy or gal that's out there and busts their butt and goes that extra mile, you know what? They need to be rewarded for that. They really do. And if you don't have an incentivization program in place for sales, you know what's going to happen? Your guys and gals, with all due respect, are going to get a little lazy because we're all like that. If we're not accountable, then we're just going to get a little lazy. So we're really big on making sure that you have incentives in place that drive sales. Number two. Got to incent gross profit. You guys, any behavior that's going to continue is a behavior that's being rewarded. So when you're setting up your compensation and incentive programs for your service advisors, GP is going to have to be one of the markers has everything to do with profitability on the job, right? So so put those uh, incentives in place. Um, one neat tip that seems to be a favorite out there that we recommend is, uh, you know, consider this even. Consider having a certain dollar amount that your service advisor can work with for a month to use for goodwill, for customer satisfaction purposes if something goes awry. But then at the end of the month, consider doing this. Whatever's left over out of this pot that they have to pull from, Half of it is theirs, and then half of it belongs to the company. So it's another really great way to incent uh, making sure that we're just not giving work away and discounting tons of work uh, for the wrong reasons. Yeah, and this is going to help you drive sales and profits at the same time, to Doris's point. So if you have an advisor that is constantly turning to you and saying, hey, can we give this guy or gal a break on the price over the here or there in a desperate way, or can we provide them with a rental car? They're just doing whatever. They're just they're just spending your money, your GP, then to Doris's point, figure out what that normal number is, how much a month you've been working with on an average. And as an example, if you find out that you're giving away about $400 a month in discounts and rental cars and all those, then all that you need to do is say to your guys and gals, look, we're going to set up a budget that's going to be $400 a month, and that uh, at the end of the month, whatever's left in there, then we're going to split the balance. That way, it's theirs to lose. This is one of the best-kept secrets. Number three, doors to click on the, not the, yeah, thanks. Number three, customer satisfaction. So when you're putting together your compensation program, you need to pay attention for advisors. You need to pay attention to incentivize sales, incentivize gross profit, and make sure CSI is in place as well. All three bills have to be rang for them to, uh, for them to really reap the rewards of your company. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Those are the three, guys. The three big ones. Okay. Tip number five, guys. And don't miss out on this one, all right? Doris, can you uh, help us with this one? So, first things first, uh, before all of this, we've got to have the right uh, the right uh, systems in place here. And this one says set minimum levels of acceptable 
performance for your staff. So, guys, this is uh, this is going to really ensure the success of your mission. Uh, but not only that, it's sort of like your kids and grades in school. If you have children, uh, at what point is the grade going to be an acceptable performance? Is it okay if they come home with uh, all Bs? Is is it when it gets to a C that we want to address the behavior? Um, or is it a D? Hopefully it's not a D, <laughs> right? So uh, <laughs> that's me. So basically, the kind of a neat way to consider setting your minimum levels of acceptable performance for your staff would be to take your annual sales goal and then break that down into monthly and weekly and daily goals so that even if that minimum level is met, you're going to reach that goal for the year. Hopefully that makes sense. And then have the goal be shooting. Uh, above that even. So this is a key factor, letting your people know where are the sidelines, just like the game of football. I love Bob uses the football analogy for business so often, but this also really plays in here. Where are the sidelines? When are we out of bounds? When is it warranted a chat or a conversation? So this is critical to your success. Yeah, it's interesting, and I love how Doris thinks. It's interesting how many clients that we have when they first come to us, they'll tell us that sometimes they'll have goals in place, most often, if they tell us that they have them, they have them in place, but they're the only ones that know them. Even their employees don't know what the goals are, which I think is interesting. But then they don't put the minimum levels of acceptable performance in place. So I'm Bob, and I own Elite Auto Service, and Doris is going to be my advisor, and she's going to be working with me. And we're going to have a goal as an example of $20, $22,000 a week is going to be the sales goal. Well, that's all cool and good, but just like she said earlier with the children with grades, she has to have an MLAP, minimum level of acceptable performance. So she knows at the end of the quarter, we have an expectation that she's selling at least $20,000 a week. If not, and if she's not there, we're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation about what training, what needs to be changed, what do we need to do differently in order to get from here to there. So goals are something that you're going to reach for, reach toward, that are going to cause you to stretch. The minimum level of acceptable performance is the expectation that you have of their productivity. So guys and gals, do this with everybody in your company. Certainly start with your advisors. This is, this is a give in. And uh, that daily car count and sales goals. So uh, Bob said sometimes he'll notice that people don't have goals that they even share with their employees and uh, a lot of shops to do, but they may have it set to where it's a monthly goal, for example. Well, in a world of, let's say, a service advisor, just using them as an example here, that's a world away. <laughs> that's, that's living in, in just putting out fires and dealing with the customer, and a month is a long time in that world. So it's better to actually take this monthly goal and distill it down not only into weekly, but into daily goals. Because if you think about a day, what defines success at the end of that day? Was it busy successful? Were customers coming through the door meaning you were successful? Not if you've got Groupons coming in, right? <laughs> All these coupons where it's a bunch of free work. But just uh, you, you, once you define that, now at the end of the day, if I'm your service advisor, I go, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I'm striving for. There's definition there, there's clarity there. I can shoot for that, I can focus on it. I can start to get creative. If I don't have all the cars that I need in through the door that I'm responsible for, I might call Larry Smith, who's got an appointment on Friday and it's Tuesday, and let him know, hey, great news, Larry, I know you wanted to get in, and we've got an opening, and you know what, I think I could squeeze you in today. Would you want to come down and get it in sooner? I'm going to start to get creative. Just watch this work for you. Um, so define success for your staff, but if, when you set these, the most important thing is making sure that don't just set them and leave them. As a leader, you have to constantly be touching them on these goals. And if I were owning a shop today, every day I'd be checking in with my staff and I'd be saying, hey, guys, how are we doing? You know, where are we? You know, oh, gosh, check it out. I've only got 500 more to sell for the day. I'm totally going to hit this goal. Great, go get them, you know. So we, we've got to make sure that we're constantly reinforcing and we make these important to us as well as to the staff. Yeah, what, what a great message, huh? How could you disagree with Doris? How could you disagree with that, that message? It's uh, Doris. Uh, you're so on target. Look, guys and gals, when I was still in the auto repair business, one of the things that I discovered is monthly goals do not work. You need to have them, but you know what? If that's all that you have, you're going to get in trouble every single time. And speaking to all of you that just have monthly goals, like George said earlier, just think about it for a moment, all right? That's out of sight, out of mind for your advisor. An advisor comes to work and he's got two customers, three customers, eight customers that day. Monthly goal, that number means nothing to him or her. 
And after the first week or the second week, if they're having a bad first couple weeks, they're going to give up on week number three or week number four. That's the mm -hmm. promise that I'll make you. So there's a lot of reasons that monthly goals just set you and your advisor up to fail. On the other hand, when I discovered when I was still in the auto repair business, when you break it down into weekly goals, things start to change. When you break it down into daily goals, your whole world will then change. I'm going to make you another promise. If you do nothing else during 2015, nothing else in your business, nothing changes, other than setting daily goals and effectively monitoring and measuring the performance of your guys and gals, your sales will more than likely increase, you're going to love this number, 10 to 15%. And you know where that number is coming from? My watching hundreds of shops over the years that have taken our recommendation to do it. Now. Watch how your world changes when you start setting daily and uh, car count and sales goals. And Doris, I know that we have a limited amount of time, but i got a question for you on that. When they are setting daily goals, should they be ascending or descending? They need to make sure that they're descending, guys. So, in other words, it's just a shift in focus and psychology. It's uh, just, uh, again, like the game of football, right, Bob? Yeah. How many more yards do I have yet to run to get into the end zone? Or how much do I have yet to achieve to get to that goal? So, if you're constantly focused on, look what I've already done, it's just not as effective, just based in psychology. So if my daily goal is $5,000, yeah. what you're telling us, if my daily goal is $5,000 and if I sell a $500 job, instead of writing down $500 on a piece of paper, I should write down $5,000, draw a line through it, and underneath it write $4,500. Absolutely. So constantly taking away from it, seeing that number of what I have yet to sell. Okay. So midday, I could say to you then, if you were my employer, I could say to you, Doris, I still got to sell. 2200 I still got to sell $2,045.35, and I still got to get in four cars. Absolutely. There you go, guys. Absolutely. You know, take it from the gal that knows. Don't hesitate on this. Watch how your world will change if you do it. And uh, we got to praise positive performance. This is a place that it can be tough if you're not used to recognizing positive performance. I think a lot of people have grown up in an environment where if I don't tell you you're not doing something wrong, you're doing it right, and you should be proud of that. But you know what? Uh, we've got to feed the hearts of our staff. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a there's no argument to this. So any behavior that continues as being rewarded, and it doesn't have to be a reward in a financial way. It doesn't necessarily have to be a reward uh, monetarily speaking. But just a genuine thank you. I recognize what you did. The closer that you can praise the performance as this special moment happens. For example, you walk by the service counter and you see your service advisor just did a phenomenal job handling a really difficult customer. Pull her into your office. Say, you know, I, I just, do you have a minute? Sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one praise with her and let her know, you just did a really great job. You know what, I knew when I hired you that you'd be the one that could handle these difficult situations with the customers and you just proved yourself. Thank you for being the kind of person you are. Thanks for being a part of this team. All right. So get into the habit of seeking this out. Um, don't be, Joe Marconi calls it sniper management, yeah, where, yeah, yeah. where one style of management is to go around constantly lurking around and looking for opportunities to correct yeah. performance versus taking a slightly different approach and looking to praise positive performance. It's really going to be more effective than the latter. Yeah, great point. You know, one of the things that we do is we have a course that's titled Fly with the Eagles. It's an AMI accredited business development course. It's actually four and a half days long. The next one's going to be in January. And the reason I mention that to you is we devote one entire day to employee management. And it's always amaze, amazes me every time I'm at the class how I see all the light bulbs come on with all the guys. We're dealing with stuff that is really simple, stuff that you learned when you were small children, what we all learn with small children, but we forget when we get into the world of business. It's praising positive performance. It's knowing how to praise positive performance, knowing when you need to ask an employee to sit down and give them those accolades, knowing when you need to do it publicly, not privately, or privately, not publicly. These are critical to your success. So the right guy or gal in the seat, the right employees working with you, the right systems, and then you doing the things that you need to do as a business owner by becoming a really extraordinary manager of the people that work with you. That's why we decided, Doris and I decided to put that point in there, because we know that if you don't do that, then everything else that we've covered with you just isn't going to work. And uh, never forget the principal purpose of business. And it was Peter Drucker that actually was the gentleman that said this and made such a profound statement. The principal purpose of business is to create a customer. He never said it was to create an income. And the more that we can focus on creating the customer in every way, shape, and form, and really focusing in on all these key tenants that bring that together, the more successful we're going to be.
Yeah, amen. And I, I agree with Doris, and I'm sure that you will too. And look at the last one that we have on this list, guys, gal, because never put money ahead of people. And those of you that are business owners, you actually have, and I know that I'm getting off subject a little bit, but it's our job to help you in every way that we can. We've been talking about the job description in, in part about service advisors. Let's talk about your job description as a business owner. It's very short, but it's very heavy. It carries a lot of weight into it. It's very profound. There's actually five things that you're responsible to do as the owner of a business. Number one, set the goals of the company. Number two, it's your job to create the plan. How are you going to get from here to there? That's your responsibility. Number three, you've got to hire remarkable people, not good people, great people, people that are truly gifted. You've got to bring them into your company. Number four, it's your job to bring out the best in the people that work with you. That means you need to catch them doing things right. You've got to give them that positive performance. And last but not least, number five on your job description, it's your job to ensure the success of the company. How do you do that? Well, one of the things you need to do is constantly remind the guys and gals that work with you what you're building, what you're doing. You need to remind them of these principles. You need to remind them of never putting money ahead of people. You need to remind them that the purpose of your business is to help people, to generate people that are happy with you, that believe in you, believe in your ethics, and go out and tell the people in your community about you and have more people come toward you. Companies that we bump up against that are myopic, they're all focused in on money, all that they think about is the bottom line and nothing else. You know what? Those guys come into the world of business, and you know what? They go out of the world of business. They do, because their reputation catches up with them. Do the right things for the right reasons, and, and money will inevitably follow. Well, Doris, I know that we have uh, just a little bit of time left with these guys and gals, and the last thing in the world that we're going to do is overstare a welcome. If any of you have any questions about any of the content that we've covered here today, all that you need to do is raise your hand, and we'll be more than happy to, uh, to answer that for you if we can. If you look at the screen on the right, you'll see a little icon of a little hand somewhere. All that you need to do is press on that. Again, we'll just give you a couple seconds to take a look at that and see if there's any hands that came up. And I know we see. Oh, okay. It looks like no hands have came up. All right, guys and gals, before we let you run, a couple of different things. One of the things I like to do is I'd like to remind you. We got a question. Oh, we got a question. We're going to back up. Okay. All right. <laughs> Can we click on that and see if we sure can help can. this fella? Oh, he might be a call-in user. He might be a separate call-in user, Doris. Jeff, can you chat your question to us? You know, Jeff, know Jeff, you know what you could do? Hey, Jeff, why, why don't you just do this? Uh, you could uh, give us a call. Here, why don't we do this? I'll help my friend Jeff. Jeff, I'm going to give you a phone number. You ready? All of you. You might want to write this number down, 800-204-3548. That number again is 800-204-3548. Jeff, all that you'll need to do, I know that you have a question and we're unable to answer it, so what we'll do is if you call in with your question, what we'll do is we'll help you with that question. It looks like Michelle had a question too. Michelle, you call in and we'll help you as well. Uh, to the rest of you, I would like to say thanks so much for joining us. Really uh, an honor to be able to spend this time with you. I can only hope that we met with your expectations. Again, if you'd like to learn more about our products and services, you can either give us a call at 800-204-3548, or you can visit us on the website at EliteWorldwide.com. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you so much for being here. It was an honor to be with you today. We wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving. We do. We certainly do, and a happy holidays as well. Thanks so much for your faith in us. Thanks for your faith in us, guys. Bye.